Okay. So uh, this is our last chat, our last section in math analysis honors. Now, if you didn't watch the videos over the break, you'll be able to, um, I think what I'm going to do is try to attach them when uh, Mr. Fangshin puts the list of, or um, I'll, we'll see. I think I'll put the videos in both the joint class and then in the individual classes for Mr. Fangshin and I. And then Ms. Nicholas, I think she has a different system. So um, we'll just make sure that I give her the videos for each week because they're already made. And there's some errors in them, so don't be alarmed. <laughs> okay. uh, there's a couple errors in uh, be, that was before we were doing live. Okay, so this is 12.2, and this is evaluating limits. I would say I rarely use a table. I rarely make a graph. But there are two situations where I do make a graph. Um, absolute values. Now that's throughout calculus. Okay. So this is um, all of calculus. If you ever see an absolute value, my recommendation is going to be to graph. Okay. And then the other time I make a graph is if I have a piecewise function. Sometimes I make a graph. But actually, I personally don't usually use a graph, but most people use a graph. Okay. So what the normal way is, is um, it's called algebraic. The method's called algebraic. And it's basically direct substitution. Let me erase that. Write that better. Okay, so direct substitution. And there's two situations. One is you get just a normal number. Or you get zero over non-zero. And zero over non-zero is zero. Um, if you get a different situation, if you get zero over zero, or you get a zero in the denominator and a non-zero in the numerator, you're going to have different situations. Okay, zero over zero, um, usually I try to factor, I try to multiply by the conjugate. Um, use a trig formula, graph it, use the table. These are my emergency methods when I have no other method. Okay, so this is usually factor and cancel, not just factor, but factor and cancel. And then uh, let me draw this little line here. If you get a situation where you have a non-zero over a zero, usually then I make a table or I investigate. Okay, now you're not gonna have non-zero over zeros in this lesson. You're gonna have, this is gonna be in calculus, okay? So you will not have it in our class. Okay, so this is in AB calculus. Okay, so you investigate both sides. And then usually I choose a real close number. And I might show you one of them here today. So say it was limit as x approaches 3 of 1 over x minus 3 squared. When I substitute the 3 in, I get 1 over 0 squared. And that's where this is not on your homework. So this one's not on your homework. Okay. And then I pick a close number like 3.1 or 2.9. And then I check the left and I check the right. 
So this is kind of the future plan. We'll call this future plan. But the answer is going to be positive infinity or negative infinity. They're pretty cool. Okay, but you'll learn that next year in the fall. They don't need to learn that before then. This is what we're going to focus on mostly today. The factoring and canceling, the multiplying by the conjugate. I'm not sure if we're going to use a trig formula, graph it in a table. So these are the, the methods we're going to focus on today. Okay, so um, what I'm going to start with, okay, is I'm going to start with this example. So example one, limit as x approaches 4 of 1, not 1, sorry, um, x minus 4 over x squared minus 16. So direct substitution means you substitute it in. And the idea, if you watched video 12.1, is you're thinking, if I substitute in and I get a number, that tells me where Mr. Knox is. And if we're saying meet at Mr. Knox's room, well, hopefully Mr. Knox is in his room, and then we'll know where to go. So that's why we're substituting in four, although truly limits are meant to be substituting in 3.99999, um, you know, 3.9, 3.99, 3.99999, 3.99999, up until four and see where it's going. And then also check the other side, 4.5, 4.1, 4.01, 4.0001, 4.0001, 4.0001, and what you wanna see what the wise approach is. But usually Mr. Knox is home. So usually you substitute the numbers in. So um, when I substitute it in, I'll write it out. Um, I get four minus four. And you don't substitute in 3.9 or 4.1 when you're doing direct substitution. You substitute in the actual value. So I get zero over zero. Now zero over zero has a specific name. So let me write it, I'll write it up here. This is called indeterminate. Okay, let me print that too. I-N-D-E-T-E-R-M-I-N-A-T-E. -E -E. Indeterminate. And you know what, let me, I've always wondered, I sometimes spell it differently at the end. So let me just double check Google while you guys are writing that. And then I'll tell you why it's indeterminate, kind of interesting. But let me look it up first. Indeterminate. Cool. I'm spelling it right. Okay, that's exciting. <laughs> I didn't think I was spelling it right. Okay. okay. Over the years, I've changed my spelling. Okay, so zero over zero. Now zero over zero means I decay. Okay, it means I don't know. It's called indeterminate. Oops. Okay, so the problem with indeterminate, would you put I decay on the answer line for a test? You take the AP test and you're like, oh, okay, I don't know. And then you're like, oh, I'll just put IPK on the answer. I don't know. You can't put I don't know. That doesn't make sense. So you can't put I don't know. Now, zero over zero can be anything, but in each specific question, it's something specific. So I'm going to show you how to do it, and then I'm going to show you why zero over zero is indeterminate. Okay? So um, what you do is kind of friendly. Usually I try to factor. So X minus four. And then the bottom factors, x minus 4x plus 4, difference of squares, those cancel. And I get 1 over x plus 4, limit as x approaches 4. Now, what happened is I actually removed the problem. The x minus 4s are what was creating the zeros. So I resubstitute in again. I usually substitute sideways and simplify down. So my downs are simplifying. And my sideways is substitution, but that's not anything that's required. That's just because when I go sideways, I forget to put the limit word. When I go down, I forget to put the limit word, but then I have to add it back in and I have space. So this is one over eight. So that's the answer. So it's gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, one type is factoring. And this is actually for, I can tell you which questions it's for. It's for seven through 22. I don't know if you have all of those to do, but that's the group. 
Okay, so seven for, uh, for number seven through 22. It says, find the limit if it exists. Use a graphing utility to check. Don't do that. Okay, so one eighth. So that's it. Now, um, we're gonna put from before, okay? Like you're done, this is the end. We're gonna put the end. Okay, but I wanna show you the links. Okay, so if I graphed this one, okay, so if I graphed this one, it looks like this. Remember what I said that you need to study? before calculus is graphing. <laughs> okay, so I know what that graph looks like. But likely you would not know what that looks like. Okay, so I graphed it, I, I graphed it the teacher method, okay? So, but just to link, say you graphed it on the graphing calculator and it looked like this, um, what's happening as you approach four and what's happening as you approach four this way there is an open circle there because it was undefined, but the open circle is at one eighth. Now I wouldn't have known where it was, except that the algebraic method gave me one eighth. Okay, and then you could also do a table, right? So if I was doing a table, I would do, I'm approaching four, so I would do maybe 3.5, 3.9, 3 3.99999, right? Probably that's it, 3.9999. And then I would make another table, X, Y, 4.5, 4.1, 4.9, 4 4.01, 4 4.0001. And I would check at what the Y values approach. So that was two different methods. One was a graphing method, one was a table method. But the most common method in limits in calculus is the algebraic method, which is what I'm showing you in the main way of example one. Okay, so this is the way they want you to do it. I just need to tell you why um, zero over zero is undefined. I mean, uh, indeterminate. Okay. So it's kind of cool. So this is really all the work that you show. Okay, you do not need to show the graph and you do not need to show the table. Okay, so I'm gonna move up. Okay, I'm gonna move back up. Actually, I'll write it over here. Y is zero over zero uh, indeterminate. Now there's a few different indeterminate. See, I spelled it wrong, that's interesting. Okay, so there's a few different versions of indeterminate. Zero over zero is the most popular one, but infinity over infinity is also indeterminate. And there'll be more indeterminates when you get to BC calculus. Okay. Okay, but why is zero over zero indeterminate? Okay. Eight divided by two is something. We'll put question mark for the moment. Then we're going to put because. Okay, so. How do you do this as a multiplication? So how would you set this up if you didn't know the answer was four? So don't use four in your answer. Wouldn't you say two times blank equals eight? And then you'd be looking for the number on the blank. And the blank is four. And that's why the answer is four. Okay, but take a look at this one. And this one I'm going to have you guys answer. So zero over zero equals question mark. So you need zero times blank to equal zero. So zero times what equals zero? So you guys answer in the chat area. Zero times anything, exactly. It could be zero, it could be two, it could be three. In this case, it's one eighth. It could be pi. 
Isn't it cool? So now they never told us that. Now, technically, if you type into your calculator, zero divided by zero, it does give you, um, it gives you an error. It might say uh, domain restriction. It's interesting because if you think of zero for zero, you could make an argument for like four different answers. Okay. Zero in the numerator. What's zero over six? What's zero over seven? What's zero over a half? What's zero over 25? What's zero over 18? What's zero over 0.1? Zero over anything is zero. But five divided by zero is undefined. 6 divided by 0 is undefined. 0 0.1 divided by 0 is undefined. Negative 0 0.1 divided by 0 is undefined. So 0 over 0 is different. It, Richard, there's more that shatters reality. 0.9 repeating. 0.9 repeating is 1. That's crazy. Like, it gives you a headache. It's kind of cool. Okay. So what about uh, 5 over 5? What's 5 over 5? 1. What's 3 over 3? One. What's two over two? One. What's one over one? One. Point one over point one. One. Negative point one over negative point one. One. So how come zero over zero is not one? Exactly. Surely isn't everything divided by itself one? Okay, so zero on the top means zero. Zero on the bottom means undefined. Zero, same number over itself means one. It's crazy, right? It's so crazy, anyway. But we've never showed you this before. Oh, this one's another one. You, uh, I, uh, let me show you another one. So, bright future. Zero to the zero power. You won't learn this one until BC or college. If you're a, a junior right now and you're taking AB next year, you'll learn BC in college. So, um, or you might not have to take math again. Anyway, zero to the zero. What's anything to the zero? One. Mm -hmm. What's zero to any power? What's zero to the fifth? Uh-huh. There's where the conflict comes. Now, these are not really zero. So you'll hear me say this in BC or HL. You'll hear me say, it's not actually zero. So, so when I'm up here, substituting these in, you see where I substituted in four? I'm going to highlight it. But see where I substituted in four? Remember, I was substituting in Mr. Knox, right? I was substituting in actually four and say, hey, where's Mr. Knox at four? But really, aren't I supposed to be plugging in 3.9999999999 and 3.9999999 at the bottom? So really, these zeros are near zero. I shouldn't write that in high letter. They're near zero. So we talk about that a little bit in a BC because there's some other situations where, <laughs> where we want zero to the infinity to be zero. Where zero, anyway, it's very complicated. But anyway, so this one is really near zero, and this is near zero. I and mean, we don't usually write that in the problem, but remember, four is kind of holding the place, but I really want to plug in 4.0001. So that's where uh, all this stuff gets kind of interesting. Very interesting. Now, don't scare your younger brothers and sisters with this stuff, okay? Because if you if you freak them out with <laughs> with zero over zero, they're gonna forever be um, stressed until they're your age, okay? And then when they finally learn about how it works, okay. So this is also indeterminate, actually. I always think of indeterminate as conflicting answers. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, but on that vein. Um, Sophia, on the shouldn't we teach in it early? Um, when I teach algebra one and I teach square root of negative one, I don't say it's not possible. I don't say it's not possible. I say it's I in algebra two and it's not real in algebra one. So Think of it as not lying. We are omitting. You've never seen zero over zero before. And I'm telling you, if your 
high school brains and my teacher brain cannot handle zero over zero or 0.9 repeating is one, definitely you don't need to stress little kids out. Okay? <laughs> anyway. Anyway, that's just a second. Okay. It's very cool. So calculus is pretty cool. BC is cool. BC is cool. HL is really interesting. I love HL. The reason I love HL is because it puts all of the topics kind of you've ever learned and then it links them. So it's really awesome. Like I'll be teaching about, well, yeah, a little bit you guys have seen if you did the work over the break where I'm doing uh, equations of planes, right? From geometry. And I need to use a cross product and a cross product is about um, matrices. So I'm using vectors, I'm using matrices and I'm using different kinds of multiplication. Vectors have two different kinds of multiplication. Dot product, cross product. Limits, this is a brand new thing. We're used to just substituting values in, but what about really close values? Anyway, it's really cool. Okay, so um, you saw this first question, but the red is pretty straightforward, right? Substitute, if you get zero over zero, recognize it's not what you think. You don't know, so you have to change the format so that you can work it out and find the answer. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's do another one. So this is example two. Okay, you have limit as x approaches 6. Um, let's say square root, oh, not 6. Let me do 36. Okay, so square root of x minus 6. And at the top, we'll have x cubed minus 216. Oh, no. That doesn't work. Okay, let me make a better one. Um, nine. Okay. Okay, so um, first step is not to just whip out a graph. I'm winning what this graph looks like, unless it's an absolute value. And it's an absolute value, I always bring out a graph. So that's in derivatives, in calculus, in antiderivatives, in calculus, or in limits. If I ever see an absolute value, the first thing that goes in my brain is graph it because it's straight lines. I'd much rather do straight lines. I don't want to separate it algebraically. I just draw my two straight lines, and then I'll be able to tell a lot of information from that. Okay, so for this one, you substitute it in. So 9 to the third, uh, 729, and divided by square root of 9 minus 3. Now, I believe that that's 729. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, 0 over 0. And then I look at this, and I say, oh, no, that's indeterminate. So indeterminate kind of means keep going, okay? Because you're not going to put IDK on the answer line. And we don't know which number it is. So we know it could be anything, but for this specific situation, what is it? The first question for the specific information, it was one eighth. And we're like, yeah, zero times one eighth is zero. So that makes sense. But so we need to dive in and get further information in order to figure it out. Okay, do you guys remember how to um, factor that top? Anybody remember how to factor this top? Yes. Okay, so Shirley wrote the formula out. So it's x minus, and basically you're looking for three things that multiply to be x, 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 and three things that multiply to be 729, so 999. So x minus 9. And then the way I do it is I square the first one, so x squared. But really, it's like one of them goes here, and then the other two go here. Okay, and then for this one, the 9 goes here. And then the other two go at the end. So this is a uh, plus 81. And then this is minus nine. 
And then what I do personally, but you don't have to do this, is I pick one of these and one of these, and you multiply them. Actually, I usually multiply these two, the x and the negative 9. So I multiply the x and the negative 9, and I get uh, negative 9x. I better not write it right there, though. So um, over here, I get negative 9x. And then in Algebra 2, I call it the cancellation term. So that's why you have to change it to a plus. But if you look at what Shirley put, which is, um, or yeast one, is that uh, A minus B, A squared plus AB plus B squared. Um, no, radicals actually, uh, if they draw the square root sign, they want the principal square root. So they only want the positive one. Okay, and then I'm going to tell you uh, why you're confused on that. It's because of the way we teach this one topic. It's a good question, though, but square root is a function. So um, when we do draw the square root graph, if you remember for square roots, we just graph it like this, right? We do not graph it with the, the top and the bottom unless it was written originally differently. So we would not draw this, and that would be the plus or minus. Okay, let me finish this question and then remind me to go back to this. Okay, so we're going to put y is square root of 9 not plus or minus 3. Okay, so I will go back to that after, but let me finish this one. Okay, so um, does anything cancel? You see anything cancel? It doesn't cancel. So you're like, uh-oh. Okay, so let's scroll back up at our methods. Do you see where I put factor? Cancel. Okay, well, I factored. Nothing canceled. So I'm a little sad. How about this one? How about multiply by the conjugate? Does this one make you feel like you could multiply by the conjugate? What do, you th what do you think? I think I can multiply by the conjugate. Now, why do you multiply by the conjugate? You multiply by the conjugate because I need to somehow change that denominator because otherwise it's, it's indeterminate. Okay, so you're going to multiply by the conjugate. Remember, the conjugate is exactly the same thing but with the, um, the other sign. I know it is crazy work, Shirley. It's just crazy, but it's cool. So it's brand new and you're going to like it and you're going to be very good at it. You'll get a better grade this uh, next year than you will have gotten in this class. Okay, so you're going to only distribute the conjugates. Okay, please do not distribute the numerators. Okay, don't distribute the numerators. You will be very, 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 very sad. Okay, because you will have to refactor and you will not be able to refactor. So I'm just going to write out the whole numerator, which is a bunch of junk, it looks like right now. And the denominator is radical x times radical x, that's x. And then radical x times positive 3 is plus 3 rad x. And then that's negative 3 rad x minus 9. And those cancel and you get x minus 9. So I'm going to rewrite this just so you could see it better. Now, this is why I did not multiply out the non-conjugates, because I needed that uh, x minus 9 to cancel, because I needed to get rid of the 0 in the numerator and the 0 in the denominator. Now, um, I need to go back up to any step that had an x and put the limit in the front. Okay, And I made a really hard one, so the ones on your homework aren't quite as hard as this one. I combined a couple topics into one example. Those cancel, and what I actually got rid of is I actually got rid of the zero. So I got rid of the reason it was zero over zero, and now I can figure out what the rest is. So I'm going to substitute the nine in to all the spots, and I get nine squared plus nine times nine plus 81, and then radical nine plus three. So that's three plus three, which is six times. <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to sneeze in my hand. I'm supposed to sneeze in my elbow, but I'm just not very good at that. Okay. Hopefully my pen's not infected. Okay, 81 plus 81 plus 81 is um, 243. And there, this wasn't in the denominator. This was in the numerator, right? So 8, 1, 5, 2, 12, 14. I think it's 14. So that would be the answer. I'm not going to graph this one so that we can see that that's the y value of the answer. Um, I don't have any spots that don't have x's. 
so I don't need any more limits. <laughs> Thank you, Shirley. I was like, why are you blessing me? Oh, because I see. Okay. okay, so you're gonna, the ones with square roots, usually you multiply by the conjugate. Now, one thing that's kind of cool, let me show you something. Uh, I'll, I'll show you down here. Is if I had a situation that was like this, I'm trying to think of one. Okay, say I had this, which would be zero over zero. I, I This is zero over zero if I work this out. What I would actually do is I would multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. And we did that a long time ago in chapter one. And you guys probably thought, what in the world are we doing? So in chapter one, we did this too. Anyway, you multiply by the um, numerator and only distribute out the conjugates. Don't multiply out this bottom. So you would keep this bottom. And eventually the X minus seven would cancel. And then you would substitute the seven back in. We're not going to do that one, but I just wanted to show you. Okay. So um, I'm going to go back up to this other side. So... It's interesting because I wish all of the math books taught it the same way, but I only have seen one math book that effectively explains this problem. You know the problem x squared equals nine? Now I'm gonna write this in multiple steps. So the next step would be square rooting both sides. Now the problem is, Every math book, except for one that I've seen, one out of all the math books I've ever seen, only one shows the middle step. The middle step is so important, but nobody ever shows it. Teachers, how would teachers even know it was there? I just happened to teach out of a book that happened to show this step, and then everything made sense. Okay, but before that, I was using like, well, sometimes when I square root both sides, I get a plus or minus, and sometimes I don't, you know? And anyway, so let me show you the real step. Okay, now you know this step right here. Okay, so I think that the books do a disservice to our students because you think that square root of nine is plus or minus three, and you think square root of X is X. Neither one is true. Now the answer's right. Okay, the answer is right, but the steps are not right. Okay, so in reality, the left side is absolute value of x, and the right side is plain three, and then it splits into two answers. Now, if you had this problem and you were square rooting both sides and you did the plus or minus thing, it would not make any sense. So this is wrong. But if you did the absolute value, which is true and real, and then you split it, you would get x is less than 3 or x is greater than negative 3. And then that would be the answer. And then there's a calculus problem where you do an integral, and it turns out that if you think that the square root of x squared is x, then you get the answer wrong because it's not in an equation. So this fact right here is very important in calculus. Eh, you could still get a five without knowing it. But um, so square root of nine, if the square root is already written on top, it's called the principal square root. Okay, so it's the principal root and the principal root is only the positive one. The plus or minus actually comes from the absolute value. It does not come from the square root of nine. But that's very confusing. And I'm telling you, almost nobody knows it because in every single book, they they just, they show the step and you look like you end up with both sides wrong. Your brain thinks square root of x squared is uh, x and it thinks that square root of nine is plus or minus three. Neither one is true. It's kind of crazy. Uh, most people do not show that step I haven't read. Okay, so if you ever show it, whoever's looking at it is going to think you're crazy. Okay, but still, it's correct, and it makes everything make sense. 
Okay, when I used to tutor, I used to say, if you draw your own square root in, it's plus or minus. And if you do not draw your own square root in, and they just had the square root in the original problem, then it's just positive. So I was making something up, but that helped. That was the pattern. And they had the square root originally, so that's why in the other way, it's just the positive version. But there is a real reason and a real reason that we were confused. Um, and I was confused until I was teaching maybe my... 19, I don't know, 1995. Okay, and then I was seven years after I graduated from high school, six years after I graduated from high school. And then one day I saw this book and I was like, really? That step? That step was like a miracle. Okay, but anyway. okay. so um, let's take a look at another example. Now, I think you're pretty good at those. So you're just going to play with them and figure them out. Okay, let me show you another one. So this is example three. Okay, so limit as x approaches five of absolute value of x minus five over x minus five. So I look at that and I say, okay, substitute in because that's what your plan is. Oops, don't substitute in for the five. You substitute in for the x, substitute, substitute. And I get zero over zero. Okay, and that means continue basically. Okay, so continue, don't give up. At the moment it's IDK. Official math term is indeterminate, but I don't think most people write out the whole word. Okay, so indeterminate. So I, I make my list. I think factor it. It's an absolute value. I can't factor. Multiply by the conjugate. Uh, I don't see a square root. Hmm. Three. I guess I have to go back up to my list. Use the trig formula. Okay, that'd be a no. Uh, four and five were graph and table. Do I know what this looks like? I don't know what it looks like. So I'm gonna graph with the table. Now, I also told you, okay, um, Mazu, I'm going to go up for a minute. Way up here, that if you ever have an absolute value in calculus, you should make a graph. So make a graph. And you're like, Miss Nichols, I have no idea what this graph would look like. I agree with you. You wouldn't know, but we practice it. Okay, so you're going to practice it in AB calculus, and then you're going to remember at least vaguely what it looks like. It won't be perfect. Okay, so uh, let's make a little table. Now, right now, I'm not making a table to find the limit. I'm trying to graph. So I don't know what the graph looks like, so I'm going to make a table. Okay, so I'm going to graph y equals absolute value of x minus 5 over x minus 5. I have no idea what it looks like, so I'm going to substitute a number in. 7. I just picked a number. So what do you get when you substitute seven in? And you guys, I'm not picking numbers near five. I'm just, just picking numbers because I want to graph it. I don't want to plug in decimals if I don't have a calculator. One, I agree. So I substitute that in and I get one. What about eight? Still one. I agree, nine is one. Okay, how about six? One. Okay, this is boring. Uh, five, I don't know because it's all crazy. So we don't know about five. So how about four? Is it one? Uh, that's positive one. That's negative one. Nah. So what's one over negative one? Negative one. Yep. Yeah. What about three? What is it? Oh, that's good. Hmm. My boyfriend just brought me this cool drink. I was thinking it was an acai smoothie. 
So I'm super glad I asked him before I drank it. Do you, do you remember when you ate kettle corn for the first time? And you thought it was going to be like regular popcorn? And you're like, that's so nasty. And you didn't even know that it was only because you were expecting it to be sweet. No, you're expecting it to be salty and it was sweet. So that's why I'm, I'm lucky I asked. Totally looks like a, a Sly smoothie, right? Oh my gosh. It's not. It's like beets and kale and all sorts of good fresh stuff. Okay, so you guys surely went through a whole process. How about the rest of you? Do you agree with the negative one? She's now decided it's negative one. You guys, does anybody else have any opinion? Only Shirley's talking. Anyone else? Is anyone still there? Everybody's still there? Negative one? <laughs> Shirley, that's how I feel. I'm totally talking about myself. Negative one. Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you, guys. That's how I feel sometimes. I'm talking to myself sometimes in class, too. I'm talking to myself, and nobody answers. Okay, so this is cool. Okay, so let's... um. Let's graph what we have so far, and then we'll make a decision later about more values. This is called graphing with curiosity. I have no idea what it looks like. That's interesting. So, Sophia, I know for me personally, it's, I don't know if it's the school system, maybe it's the school system, but I know in my class, that's my biggest problem. Students expect that they're perfect the first time they answer me like you're not supposed to be perfect we're just learning a new concept it's totally fine to be wrong you're supposed to be wrong sometimes you're not supposed to be right all the time we don't learn by being right yeah that's possible that it's the asian culture but you know what it's not only the asian culture uh, my niece is biracially uh, white and black and she's the same way she's very worried about being wrong so we had a problem where we were doing negatives and positives and it was like one minus 20. And she said, I don't know. And I know she knew because she knew the day before, like she knows how to do them. And um, she would not give me an answer. So I said, well, I just need an answer. And then whatever answer you get, I'll, I'll figure out how to help you get the right answer from there. And she just refused. So I said, okay, what if you could give me three answers and one of them's right? And so she told me negative 19, positive 19. And she said, I can't think of another answer. She said, but not, neither one of those are right. And it was negative 19, like obviously you guys know, but it's very interesting. So you're supposed to be wrong and then fix it. You're not supposed to be perfect the first time. Anyway, okay, um, back to our problem. Okay, so we don't know how to graph it, right? We don't know how to graph it. So uh, seven, one, eight, one. 9, 1, 10, 1. Okay, that's boring. How about the numbers in between? How about 7.5? When is 7.5 still be 1? 8.5, 9.5? Oh, I could draw that little line right there. I feel that line works. Okay, what about we said 4? Four? 4 was negative 1. Okay, 3 was negative 1. How about 0? Let's grab 0. What's zero? Oh, negative one again. Okay. Now five's in here somewhere. Oh, six, we got one. Now, at some point, what some people do is they'll just connect the dots. But we got to investigate farther. What's a number between 5 and 6? Can somebody give me a number between 5 and 6? Not surely, though. In my other class, these two girls were, like, racing each other, and then no one else was ever answering. They're like, how do they answer so fast? Like, 
I know the answer, but I can't type it into the chat fast enough. Okay, so uh, what's a number between five and six? Austin, can you give me a number between five and six? Annabelle? Give me any number between five and six. No. No. <laughs> That's so funny. You guys, I didn't scroll down. Oh, you guys are so funny. Oh, wait. I didn't get anything passed. You guys haven't gotten anything in the last three minutes. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this because this is interesting. Sophia, I read something that said it was because when you get something wrong and the teacher says it's wrong, you feel bad and you don't want to answer again because they feel like other people were judging them. I think that's more it than anything else. So I like to have people answer anonymously. You just answer and then we ignore the answers that are wrong. And then the answers that are right, you know, end up coming to the answer. It said the early age children are drilled in the brain that they are smart. So when they grow up to maintain image, they they take less risks and stay content. I think that's true, too. I think that's true, too. Okay, fast typers. Uh, I don't even know how to type. You guys are funny. Yes, negative one. Five point five. Oh, I like all your answers. Okay, 5.5, 5.7, 5.5, 5.5. Okay, 5.6, 5.2, ooh, I love that one. 5.2345678, 5.999. Okay, you guys are awesome. Okay, so uh, what do you get in all those cases? You get one, right? So all of those dots are right here. And then what about at five? Well, five, we don't know. So we have to put an open circle. Okay, now what about 4.9? Yeah, 4.9 is negative one. 4.5 is negative one. So you get this weird graph. Now, if you were taking a test on this, you would study the notes and this would be the weirdest graph you would see and you'd be like, I better study that one, right? So we will put like a little star, study, but we don't have any tests, so we don't really have to study. Okay, now let's go back to actually what you're gonna do in problems five and six. So this is the first two questions on the thing and what we did from the previous video. So I'm gonna write previous video. Okay, just in case some people didn't watch it. So previous video was 12.1 and we talked about graphical limits. Okay, and graphical limits are what we need here. So um, what we're doing in actually 12.2 is finding the limit as X approaches five from the negative side. And then you can put the equation or you could just put F of X. And then you put the limit as X approaches five from the positive side. And again, you could put the equation or you can put F of X. Okay, so the negative side would be the left side. So that would be this side heading towards five. So what Y value are you heading towards? I guess I should label my graph better. Okay, so let me click over here. Yes, negative one. So uh, the limit from the left side is negative one. And then the limit from the right side, and I don't know if I changed colors from the other video, but basically I'm looking at that. And what's the limit from the right side? Uh-huh, positive one. So what did we discuss? I don't know if any of you were here for the other video. So 12.1. What happened if the limits don't match? Exactly. No limit does not exist. So this means there's no limit or does not exist. So indeterminates can be no limit. Indeterminates does not exist and no limit are the same thing. They can be one-eighth. They can be pi. What was the other one? 1,200. What was this one? 1,458. Okay, so we can have different answers. Now, if the question only asked you for one side, 
Like if they only asked you for the negative side, the answer would be negative one. And if they only asked you for the positive side, then the answer would be positive one. But they're asking you for both sides. So uh, what I would write is I would write limit as X approaches five. Uh, that means overall, okay, that means both sides. And that's where you get does not exist. Okay, now that uh, is not necessarily the answer just because it's undefined. That is uh, not related. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna show you um, we also have piecewise graph. So there's a couple with piecewise graph. So let me give you the numbers. So number 37 on your homework and 38 are like example three. Okay. And then 39 and 40, you're going to graph the piecewise. Five and six, you're going to um, do the yellow and blue highlighting method. They don't want you to do it algebraically, but you're looking at both sides. And then sometimes they just ask for one side. I think like part A might ask for the left and part B might ask for the right. I can't really see because the, the things are too small. Yeah. Oh, no, they ask for different values. Okay. They ask for different values, so that's very strange. Okay. And then um, that's it for that. And then um, the, what I want to show you next, which is super cool, because, you know, I think everything's super cool, is um, this is called definition of the derivative. Okay. Now, definition of the derivative, we're going to call this the long, long, long way. Okay, so in the future, you will have a shortcut, but we want it. We have to teach you the long way before we teach you the shortcut. So in calculus, derivatives are going to be the most beautiful thing you ever saw in your whole life. Okay, so the derivatives are very straightforward. So you're going to love them. Okay, but definition of the derivative is one day in AB calc. Okay, it's just one day. Okay, so what you have is you have an equation. So let's say I have the equation of a parabola, just a very straightforward parabola. Okay, and you won't have to graph it, but just uh, I'm graphing it. Now, derivative means, in calculus, the derivative means the um, slope. Okay, so derivative in calculus equals slope. Now, on a parabola, there's the slope is different at every spot. Like, say I was walking on this parabola. Walk, 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 walk. Oh, that's a bad color. Let me do it in blue. So I'm walking down this parabola, maybe red. Okay, so I'm walking down this parabola. Walk, 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 walk. I'm going downhill. So my slope is negative. And then all of a sudden, I stop. My slope is zero. And then my slope is positive. And then it's getting steeper, 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 steeper. It doesn't stay the same all the time like lines. So that's why we need calculus in order to find the slope and then the area of strange shapes. And a parabola is a strange shape if we think about what we know from Algebra 1. We never talked about the slope of a parabola before. Okay, so we want the slope. Okay, so now um, in this lesson, it doesn't ask you to find the slope, but I'm telling you that this is the slope. So the slope has a specific notation. It's kind of like an apostrophe, but it's straight down. It's not looped. Okay, so this is in calculus. You don't have to know this for our homework, but why not know why in the world they're asking you for this weird formula? Okay, now you're going to recognize this formula. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so this formula, if you flip back to your notes, you saw this part of the formula in chapter one of our class. So we're going to link you this last lesson. We're going to link you all the way back to chapter one. It's very cool. You know what I should do in the summer? I should have an SAT2 online class. Wouldn't that be fun? I mean, fun. We could all do the same book and then talk about the questions and go over them. And then maybe my explanations would help you understand. 
can't have them in person anyway. Anyway, back to this question. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, you guys, I need to post you Eva's math analysis honors notes for the whole year. I call them Eva's notes. And um, it's a, a like, I don't know, eight PDF files. And she color codes all her notes. And she's super, super neat. And so she would have notes for this. And then I could show you those. Okay. So um, now this was in chapter one, but chapter 12 right now and calculus adds something in the front, adds a limit, limit as H arrow zero. And this is actually equal to F prime of X. This is called F prime, but you don't have to know that until next year. And you're not being tested on this anyway, so it's good for you just to see how it all uh, is played out. There you go. Looks like you can't see my whole thing there. So this formula here, I'm going to highlight the whole formula. This whole formula is the definition of the derivative. Now, fortunately, there's beautiful, beautiful shortcuts. And those shortcuts are why I don't think that you should self-study or try to learn ahead calculus in the summer. Because if your shortcut is different than the Walnut High School shortcut, then what's going to happen is you're going to always be like backwards and then you're going to be confused. So learn SAT2 math instead. Okay, so uh, this is the formula and you're going to apply it to the function. Now this one was what I really sucked at when I was your age in high school. I was in calculus and I could not figure out this formula. This formula just gave me the worst problem. I always got the wrong answer. And I was pretty good at math. So I was getting most of the other stuff right, except, you know, careless mistakes. Who cares about those? But, um, you know, you know, that might be another problem that you guys are discussing is we teachers act like we're perfect, right? Except, you know me, I don't act like I'm perfect. But we act like we, or we want to be perfect. We don't want to make any mistakes in class. And so if we don't make mistakes in class, then you're thinking that you have to be perfect. You know, and your parents want to be perfect. Everybody wants to be perfect. I don't want to be perfect, you guys. It's too much pressure. Imagine, I'm a person, right? What if I get a 94% as a person? I have a messy room. My classroom's messy. I forget stuff. I'm a little bossy. Because I'm a teacher, right? So I'm still 94%. My nose is a little, looks like a, looks like a pig, you know? So I'm not 100%, but I'm 94. 94 is totally good enough. We don't need to be 100%. Okay, so back to our problem. Okay, so let me show you this specific question, okay? So I'm going to show you how it works. Okay, so they give you the question, f of x. Oh, this is, this is way better in class. This is kind of, stuff. let's see if I can figure out how to do this here. So f of x equals x squared, and I need this. Okay, so they say limit as h approaches zero. F of, so this is the formula, and they tell you to substitute it in, and you're like, that's pointless. Well, no, it isn't pointless, because this is actually a formula in calculus. Okay, so uh, let me tell you what I couldn't figure out. f of x made sense to me, right? f of x is x squared. So I just put an x squared there. So that made sense to me. What, what always confused me, is what the heck is f of x plus h? So let me show you. Uh, my favorite way to do it now, when I'm in person, is to use scissors, which is very odd. But what I actually do in class is I, I cut this x out with scissors, OK, with scissors, and I flap it back. So I'm going to put a little blank there, OK? So the x isn't there in, anymore. And I'm trying to find f of x plus h. So what I have to do is I have to put the x plus h into the empty hole where my x is no longer. Now, you know, if you substituted an f of 7, you would put a 7 in the spot and then square it. But somehow, because this one has an, an x in it, it confuses people, specifically me. It used to confuse me all the time. So you cut it out, and that's where you put it. So it's x plus h, and then the squared still stays. And that might not be something that confused you, but it definitely used to confuse me. Okay, so that's what f of x plus h is. 
Okay, I'm going to put the X back in. Okay, so I'm going to put the X back in. But basically what it is, is you cut out the X. It's not there anymore. You push it back, and you put the X plus H in its place. <laughs> not, it could even be 99.9999999. Why do you need to be 99? You know how boring that would be? And then we'd all be the same. Our imperfections make us perfect. Look at my hair. Do you guys do you think this is perfect hair? This is not perfect hair. I have crooked eyebrows. Who cares? I'm an awesome person. I'm a good explainer. I have a good job. I love teaching. I love teaching you guys. If I brush my hair more, would that help anything? I'd look better on the YouTube video. I bite my nails. Okay, so you guys don't, you just need to be an A. So be a 90% person, be a 92% person. It's not about grades. And you can try to be better than you are at any specific thing. Okay, but don't try to be perfect. Okay, anyway, back to this. So f of x plus h, you substitute it in. Okay, and then you're going to substitute this, and I'm going to highlight this. So this part goes right here into this whole thing. Okay, and then this x squared is going to go right here. Okay, so uh, you still have your limit as long as you have an h in the problem. So f of x plus h is x plus h squared minus f of x. f of x is x squared divided by h. And then if you multiply this out, that's x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Um, I just multiplied this out like foiled. Okay, so I foiled that. Okay, minus x squared over h. Chop, chop. Limit as h approaches 0. Uh, h, 2x plus h. Now, What's going to happen is you're going to be able to factor out an H if everything went well. And then they cancel. Now, you did all of this part in Chapter 1. Okay, in Chapter 1, you did all of that. The only thing we're adding for our chapter is what do you do at the end? How do you apply a limit? What do you do with the zero? And what letter does it say? Mm -hmm. You plug zero into H. So all you do is you plug zero into H, and the answer is 2X plus zero, which is 2X. Now, the reason I'm not writing the limit word is because there's no more H in the problem. So this is actually the answer, and that's F prime of X equals 2X. Now, this actually stands for the slope. Now, you won't have to know this this year, but it's pretty cool. So it's the slope. So what if you substitute in zero? So let's look at our problem again. What if you substitute in zero right here? What's the slope? Zero. And it's flat. And the slope over here at one? If I substitute one in, it's two. So the slope is a little steeper. But if I substitute in two, that's four. That's even steeper. If I substitute in three, which the point itself is nine, but the slope is six. So as you climb this hill, it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. Anyway, so this is the long way to do the formula for the slope. Now there's a short way, and there's um, I would say the basics are about 10 formulas that you need to memorize, and then there's some individual formulas, like what's the slope of sine, what's the slope of cosine, uh, and then some other weird ones. Uh, so you have to memorize uh, a few as you go through. But the main ones, there's product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, and the power rule. So there's four plus six trig functions, and then plus random other ones. But those are your basic ones. So you're going to learn formulas, and you're going to learn rules. You just want to learn them the walnut way, because otherwise you're going to be in school and get all confused. Okay, because some people learn them different ways. Okay, but um, this is actually the power rule. So it doesn't work for all the problems we have. The power rule says you bring the exponent in the front, you bring the exponent down in the front, and lower it by one. And then you'll be able to go direct. 
So you bring the exponent in the front, lower that two by a one, and then it's x to the one, and that's the slope. So there's like a super short formula. You'll learn it, you'll practice it. You'll be like, hey, I'm pretty good at this. The only thing is sometimes we forget like how to do negative exponents. Okay, let me show you another one that's a little more complicated. And if for some reason you have to leave, it's okay to leave. And then um, you just watch this end part of the video later. I think we're about an hour in. Let me scroll down to this. Yeah, we're about an hour in, a little over an hour. Okay, so uh, let me show you a more complicated one. I'd like to show you two if I have time. So let's see. So I have f of x equals, uh, let's say square root. Uh, let's have a three in the front. Square root of x minus four. And it says find f prime of x. Well, except it doesn't say that in the book. In the book, it says find limit as h approaches zero, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And in some textbooks, they don't use h, they use delta x, which is very, very, very horribly confusing. Okay, you do have a square root one, you have a fraction one, and then you have that one. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let me show you. So I always do f of x plus h over here, because I told you I really sucked at f of x plus h. So what I do is I cut out with my little scissors. So imagine your scissors cut, 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 c
And then you put the X plus H right here and right here, just like you would with the seven. Okay, so like I said, I, I don't know, I don't know if that confuses everybody or if it just confused me, but it totally confused me and I could not figure it out. Okay, go back to the presentation. The presentation, Miss Nichols, since I'm here twice. Okay, so um, this one is three. Oops, let me let me do colors for you. So this is three radical empty minus four. And then the empty is you're shoving an X plus H into the empty spot. Okay. So um, I like to find that separate because that's the thing I always miss. So if I focus on that, then I'm good. So it says take F of X plus H, which is this. So that's the F of X plus H. Uh, that minus four is outside the radical. Minus F of X. Okay, f of x is 3 radical x minus 4. You just recopy f of x and then divide it by h. So I get 3 radical x plus h minus 4 minus 3 radical x plus 4. Oh, you guys, that's not, that's not inside. That's, that's inside. That's not outside. There's not a real way to end a radical, but I'd like to put a little hook on the end to end it <laughs> if I need to, but let me hook it over there. Over H. I didn't do anything in that step, actually. Okay, so it's a limit. So what do you do? You substitute zero in for H. So three radical X minus four minus three radical X minus four over zero. So I get zero over zero. And you're like, thanks for nothing. That's indeterminate. So what do you do with radicals? Anybody have an idea of what to do with radicals? Conjugate, exactly. So let's try. 3 radical x plus h minus 4 plus 3 radical x minus 4. And we're going to do the same thing in the denominator, which looks like a big old nightmare. But it doesn't turn out too bad. Let's see. Okay, this times this will be 9. And then that radical times the radical is just the same thing, but in parentheses. And then I'm not going to do this one, but I want to show you. I'm going to show you in blue the outer and the inner. Outer and the inner are the same, but opposite. So that's 0. That's a difference of squares. And I do not usually show the work on that. Okay, so that's zero. We'll put minus zero, plus zero. And then minus nine. This is I'm multiplying this, this one times this one. Oops. Okay, so that's minus nine parentheses x minus four. And my denominator is h times this big old ugly mess that I don't do anything with. I just rewrite. And have math faith that it will all come out nicely in the end arrow zero. Okay, numerator is 9x plus 9h minus 36 minus 9x plus 36. Probably right here is the most common mistake anybody makes is not putting a plus there. h times ugly mess. Just recopy it carefully. And remember, I told you this is the long way. We have a short way. And we learn it. This one happens to need the chain rule. So um, you won't learn that right at the beginning, but they'll teach it to you. So we have 9H over H. I'm writing one extra step in here just so you could see the order of my cancellations. That'll help you for the future. Uh, there's one quiz, I think, on definition of the derivative where you have to do it the long way in calculus. And then most often you just do it the short way. Uh, cancel out the H's. And I get 9 over 3 radical x plus h minus 4. And remember, we're trying to find the slope. And I'm not showing you why this formula is the slope, but that's kind of an interesting uh, video if you ever watched it on YouTube. Okay. Uh, substitute the h equals 0 in. Oh, was that supposed to be x plus h? Oh, you guys, that's not x. I made an error. This is an error. This is an error. That's an error. That's an error. That's an error. You guys, what's that supposed to be? Is 
That's what I thought. It's supposed to be plus H, right? But it's not. Look at the, look at my conjugate where I'm distributing with the blue. Yeah, it's supposed to be a four. That H kind of looks like an upside down four. I'm going to change it in red just so you can see it. So this is a four, a four, a four, a four, a four. So that was an error. Along the lines of, we don't need to be perfect, you guys. I just made a typo. It's not a big deal. <laughs> okay. Okay, so don't substitute it into that one because that's a four. Don't substitute H equals zero into four. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so nine over three radical X plus zero minus four plus three radical X minus four. Nine over three radical X minus four plus three radical X minus four which is nine over six radical x minus four, which is three over two radical x minus four. So this is actually the slope equation for that square root graph. Now, that is the long, long, long way. This is called definition of the derivative. You will also learn short ways Okay, so in AB Cal, you will learn short ways to find the derivative, to find this derivative, actually to find all derivatives, to find this derivative. And uh, this one's actually called the chain rule for this problem. So chain rule and power rule would be needed for this one. And they'll teach it to you. You'll do the power rule like one day, maybe two days. Then you do the product rule. Then you do the quotient rule. Then you do the chain rule for multiple days. So you have plenty of time to learn it in our, in your in your Calc AB class, okay? Yeah. So it's kind of cool. Um, one thing, just we're not going to do this whole problem, but one thing I want to tell you is if you have one like, say, 2x squared minus 6x plus 8, I'm going to show you where the most common mistake is. Okay, so here you have your x plus h substituted in. Uh, lots of people forget the neg the parenthesis with the minus. They forget the parenthesis. So when you subtract f of x, you do have to distribute this negative. And lots of people do not distribute that negative, and then the answer doesn't come out right. This is the formula. Oops. I need my limit in the front. Limit as h approaches zero. And that's f prime of x, but they won't call it that in math analysis. Okay, and that's for the last questions. That's for 47 through 50. So this is this information that I just told you, this f of x plus h information is for 47 through 50. So 47 through 50 are like these. So you'll have to make sure you distribute that out and you kind of distribute everything out. But uh, you'll remember this from an earlier chapter. You might have been frustrated because of that stupid X plus H. Not knowing where to put it. So that was a long video, you guys. But my explanations are never short. They're long and they're detailed and I don't skip steps and I... I try not to have there be any questions on the homework that you don't know how to do, but sometimes it happens because, you know, we don't have infinite time for notes. But anyway. So I'm going to stop the video and then um, you guys can uh, ask me questions or um, have any comments. But let me let me stop this so that the YouTube video people are like, oh, my gosh, it's two hours. But it's what, like an hour and I don't know, 20 minutes.